Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildebrand. Joining me, as always, my man over there in New York City, the one, the only, Dan Rubenstein, sir. It is game week. How are you? Ty, from the time we arrived on this planet and we blinked and we stepped into the sun, it became clear that there's more to see week one than can ever be seen and more to do, Ty. Are we doing Circle of Life here from the Lion King on week one? There's far too much to take in here. A nice yeah, inspirational song to get us started here in the 2018 season. I like it. I forgot yeah. that that was a thing that we do with the lyrics. Yeah, and it's time also to pay our respects to the off season, which was terrible. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> every single regard, personally, professionally, spiritually, college footballally, it was it was it was a little bit disappointing, but also like the circle of life tie. Rebirth. That's right. It's bigger, stronger, faster, and with slightly more impressive half mile times. Well, folks, welcome back. To the college football season, it feels like we've been in the doldrums forever, but that is no longer the case as we've got a whole slate of week one games that we're going to do our best to walk you through here over the next hour or so. Before we go any further, the Pick'em Pool is now officially up and running. People have been asking, how can they play against us? Not only can we post our picks out there for all y'all to observe and, I don't know, copy or jeer. We will do that on our website, solidverbal.com. But if you go to solidverbal.com slash pick'em, P-I-C-K-E-M, solidverbal.com slash pick'em, you can play for free. It's a week-to-week game now as opposed to before where you had to sign up for the whole year. If you can't play for a week, so what? There will still be a year-long leaderboard, but there's also going to be a weekly leaderboard as well. So again, solidverbal.com slash pick'em if you want to play along We got a whole host of games here that I know we're both excited to get through. I do need to ask you, though, because I feel this is important. Did you decide what you're going to do from a TV standpoint? Because this was an open issue after our last podcast on Sunday, how you are actually going to get cable coverage of these of these matchups. It will depend on a call with my cable and Internet provider. Ultimately, whoa. I'm going to wait until 1118 a.m. Eastern time on Saturday if my future is anything like my past. No, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to make a call and I'm going to be confrontational. Okay, it's going to be contentious, but I I hope that I and whoever is manning that call center headset will come out better for the experience. So if I'm if I'm cutting the cord, I'm going to go YouTube TV. Okay. If you're holding up a game from this week one slate that you can use as leverage, like if you don't give me my price, then I can't watch blank. What will what will that game be for you? What will have the most weight? Oh, goodness. Um, who's UC Davis playing? <laughs> Who are those Aggies? Those dirty, dirty Aggies? <laughs> uh, I would probably say Michigan Notre Dame because I can play the uh, the wife card. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, that's a good one. She's going to be pissed. Jody with an eye. You may have heard of her. She's going to be testy. Um, UC Davis is playing San Jose State. Okay. Take down those Spartans. Who you called half a team, I believe, during our previews earlier this year. Can neither confirm nor deny. Well, again, without further ado, the season is here. Should we just jump right in, Dan? We have a lot of games to pick. Yes. Yes. We have the Adam Amin voice meal to get to. That is correct. In Tucson this week. In Tucson this week, Uh, I should also mention that it should be up soon, but we're recording this on Wednesday at 5 p.m., my latest with our pal Jeff Schwartz on the ESPN Plus hit show. I'll take that bet. College Mm -hmm. football kickoff special will probably be up by the time you are listening to this. Um, Other than that, Ty, I've got picks galore. I've got thoughts. I spent hours studying up and figuring out how I feel about these games and slightly longer figuring out this season's song cues. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, not, not for the opening, but we, it is a big Notre Dame game. How could I let that pass? And I think the only thing I forgot to mention is going out to solidverbal.com and sign up for the newsletter. 
where you oh can get goodness. constant updates. Don't forget, you can tweet us during the games at Solid Verbal. We're also on Facebook. We're also on Instagram. We've got a subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash Solid Verbal. And oh, by the way, mm-hmm. don't forget that the voicemail line, the reverb line, as it's known, will be open at 408-VERBAL-1. That's 408-837-2251. Give us a call. Shoot us a text when we do our Sunday review show. As always, we're going to cut those up into about a three to four minute super cut and play the general fan sentiment from week one, Dan. To be to be clear about if you're new to the solid verbal, if you just started listening since last season, the reverb line is a line that you can call in and just bitch about your team, yep. celebrate your team, talk about whatever you want, and we're going to find those best comments and we play them the day after the game so sunday morning on our sunday morning recap show to just get a sense of the people tie yeah that's what it's for on that note dan i feel like this is long overdue we've waited many months for this moment shall i hit the button hit that button dan time help i need picks of the week ah it is so good to hear that mm, voice i'm rubbing my tummy tie i'm rubbing that tummy. that is music to my ears let's get rolling let's start off on saturday at high noon on the fox network we've got florida atlantic coached by one lane kiffin on the road against oklahoma These lines have changed since I put them down on our document, Dan, but (laughs) it is somewhere around the 21 or 24 point mark. Okay. It is at least three scores that the Oklahoma Sooners are favored. Now, let me get this out there. Mm -hmm. Gus Johnson, Joel Klatt, Jenny Taft, they are on the call. I will tell you first and foremost, my lock of the week. Lock of the week. What? My lock of the week is Gus Johnson steering hard, hard into Kyler Murray's status as a baseball player, Dan. Oh, yeah, of course. I thought you were going to go do something with the lane train. No, no. That could happen. the station. For what it's worth. It should also be noted Mm -hmm. that this is a Gus game. Because when, when you got Gus on the call, games tend to feel a little bit more dramatic, especially when he's got so many storylines to play with. So we've got everything on the Oklahoma side in the wake of Baker Mayfield. Obviously, you've got the Kyler Murray baseball thing. Lincoln Riley in his second year thing. Plenty to talk about on the Oklahoma front. We've also got a lot on the FAU side of things, which is also very interesting. Lane Kiffin had a really good year last year. This team is absolutely loaded again. His new offensive coordinator is a young fellow by the name of Charlie Wise Jr., So there's ammo here for Gus, and I feel like there is plenty of potential for this game to be close. How do you feel? Well, you forgot that FAU's presumed starting quarterback, I don't think anything has been made official, Chris Robeson, is an Oklahoma transfer. That's right. Big deal. Um, How do I feel about this game? I feel as if my natural inclination is going to be, ooh, Oklahoma, maybe looking past FAU a little bit, you know, just not taking them seriously. They lose their quarterback. They lose Kendall Bryles, their offensive coordinator from last year that brought them so much success. FAU, fun, big offensive explosion last year. Could they could they give Oklahoma everything they could handle? Right. For, for like a quarter and a half, maybe. <laughs> that, is, that is my general feeling. FAU, the Owls South, Bring back a lot on defense, and that is that is a thing. That is something. Defense wasn't great last year. No. It means it'll probably be better with that kind of experience. But even if Kyler Murray is tentative, even if you know he's overthrowing guys just because he's a little too eager or something like that on the opposite end of the spectrum, there is that Rodney Anderson security point. That's there what I is, got here. I got that written there, down. Yeah. yeah, there is that that offensive line. Even taking a couple hits from big hits from last year should still be good. And this defense will be healthier. This defense, I think, early on this season will look like what they look like toward the end of last season, just not the very, very end of last season against Georgia. So I look for an improved Oklahoma defense ultimately to get things under control. And I, I think Oklahoma covers this game. The thing I'm actually more confident about is the under. In this game, I don't think it's going to be particularly high scoring. And I think if Kyler Murray and Oklahoma get out to a comfortable lead, like your concerns have told you all summer, 
I don't know that Lincoln Riley is leaving Kyler Murray in there for extra reps to get him comfortable, to get him rested, to get him on to next week. So that's a recipe for a backdoor cover. It could be. Yeah, what I think potentially. I, I feel similarly about Oklahoma in this game. I love the Oklahoma offense, as we've mentioned time and again here during our preview shows. Uh, and it doesn't really matter to me who's playing quarterback. They're going to be fine on offense. Rodney Anderson should have a monster game here because he's got a beast line in front of him. And mm-hmm. to your point, an opponent that was really young on defense a year ago and had a hell of a time against the run. I think Rodney yeah. Anderson's going to have himself a pretty big game. I'm confident Oklahoma is going to win this football game, just not by 21 points. FAU still figuring out their quarterback situation, but they were objectively very good on offense a year ago. And Oklahoma is replacing four of its top six tacklers over half of their sacks from last season. If this were a game in week seven, I would feel differently with the point spread. But in okay. week one, I think Oklahoma wins this game. I actually think a lot of points. I'm going to say 42 to 27, but FAU covers. Go Owls. Should also be noted, FAU's skill talent. There is a, a rejuvenation, a big addition in Jovan Durant, the West Virginia transfer. There is high-level Power 5 skill talent, and we rightfully mention how good Rodney Anderson is. He may not be the best running back playing in this game because Devin Singletary is also that good. No. So... There may be a home run hit early on that gets Gus Johnson all worked up in the booth. Telling you, man, he's going to make it feel very dramatic. I don't think it will sustain for four quarters. So, yes, Devin Singletary is worth watching, not just against Oklahoma, but all year long. He is that good and was the best offensive player on this team last year. So there is there's a lot of high level. If If you're into speed, watch FAU Oklahoma at noon. Just do it. All right, let's move on. Saturday, 3.30, this one on ABC. We've got the Washington Huskies squaring (laughs) off against the Auburn Tigers. The point spread is down to one and a half in favor of Mm -hmm. Auburn. They are playing this one at a neutral site in Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia. Damn. Here is what I would point out, and it dawned on me when looking at this. It's dawned on me all offseason. You know, we're we're in this day and age now with college football where you can lose a big game in week one and still make it to the college football playoff. Mm-hmm. And especially in a non-conference game, either team here really could lose by 50 and still win their actual conference. But for Washington, yes. Dan, for Washington, this game truly does just mean more. <laughs> this is This is a credibility game if I've ever seen one. We talked about it in the preview. Washington needs to win this game to prove that it can win a big one. And if they get by Auburn, there's a really good chance that they're a pretty sizable favorite the rest of the way through. This game just really does mean more for Washington, which is part of the reason why I think I'm leaning pretty hard in their direction. How do you feel? Maybe the most disrespected team in schedule from last year with actual cupcakes on the field. From Quint Kessenick. Kessenich, Kessenich. Um, so yes, the the reputation of Washington and how they operate out west nationally is yes, you do good things out west, but like other Pac-12 teams, when you're faced on the national stage, whether it was struggling a ton offensively against Alabama a couple of years ago in the playoff, whether it was USC against Alabama, USC against Ohio State, you know, Oregon against LSU a few years ago, Oregon against Auburn, there is that lingering when, if ever, will the Pac-12 break through when all eyes are on this game. And this is the best game of the weekend, right? Do we, is that... <laughs> I think it's they're the two only two top ten teams playing each other. Yeah, it's a it's a good game for sure. It's one of the best games of the weekend. I don't know what Michigan and Notre Dame are ranked, but I don't think they're both single digit ranked. They're so, not. That is correct. So I think it's the best game of the weekend. I hate that it's on a neutral site. It would have been cool if it was either in the Plains or in Seattle and it was home and home. But if you like Washington in this game, it means you like Jake Browning and his pass catchers succeeding downfield. If you like Auburn in this game, it's because you think that they will not let Jake Browning do all that much because there aren't too many questions about specific personnel with Auburn. I think the biggest question for Auburn is they've struggled in September these past few years under Gus Malzahn. They've needed time to grow into the season. They are not, as we've said, they're not showers, they're growers. So whether it was what scoring 
six, seven points against Clemson last year, losing to Clemson the year before. They lost to Texas A&M at home. They had to go to overtime with Jacksonville State a few years ago. Washington State was way closer than it should have been when they actually went to the national championship game. So there is something, at least recently, about those Gus Malzahn teams. I think Jarrett Stidham is a better quarterback than what they've had those previous years. But I would be worried going against... Chris Peterson and this really good Washington staff. I think on both sides, Washington is strong. If there were ever a year and a situation for a Pac-12 team to really show out nicely, it wasn't going to be Max Brown in USC against Alabama. No. I There's still something about Jake Browning and how he's looked in his bigger games, whether it was against USC a couple years ago, you know, the game against Alabama. You know, he was, he was good last year, pretty good against Penn State, but... There's something holding me up about that, but there's also something holding up about Gus Malzahn and and just no. shaky starts for Auburn. So I'm going to go with Washington here. I think ultimately Washington, this game is back and forth and Washington gets a late stop with that secondary, whether it's a last second pick to ice things and somebody sliding down on the field, whatever it is, I have Washington finally breaking through and winning by a touchdown, even in Atlanta. Yeah, Washington's got 17 guys back pretty much the whole offense. We talked about how Washington needs a legit deep threat to take that offense to another level level, excuse me. And I've been all over Chico McClatcher. If it's not him, it should be somebody. It needs to be somebody for Chris Peterson to take that offense up a gear. Auburn is also loaded. They mm-hmm. should have one of the better defenses in the country, which is I think going to mean a big test for a Washington offense. I like Auburn. What concerns me though, is that they've got four new starters along the line and some questions about their running back position. So much of this offense relies on tempo and Gus Malzahn's creativity on the ground. Just specifically in this game, that's going to be a problem for the Tigers. It takes time to develop. Over it the takes time the to develop. Yeah. And, you know, Washington's own offense, if you trust the practice reports, is having trouble moving the ball against its own defense. Yeah, that's most schools, but yeah. And at most schools, but it's just like, Underscores the fact that this is, again, a really good defense for Chris Peterson. I am riding with him here. I think he knows what's at stake. I think Washington can start off with a statement win. I think they win the game 27-23, and Dan, I'm going to lock it up. Whoa! I am all in this year on the Huskies not only winning the Pac-12, but also going to the playoff. I I like that. I like that you locked it up, and I could sense a little bit in your voice that you missed the fact that you can't sing your Carry On Johnson song anymore. I know, I know. That's why you you have questions about running back. Yeah. You haven't haven't thought about a Cam Martin track yet. Okay. No. I'm with you. We'll work on it. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's stay on Saturday. Let's go to another big game. This one's at night. It's on NBC, 7.30. The Michigan Wolverines at the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. This point spread has bubbled and bobbled a little bit. Initially, I saw Michigan minus two. It has since come down to Notre Dame minus one. I wanted to ask you before we go too deep into this game. Oh, God. Hot dog. Kelly's boys have (laughs) have a fierce one on their hands with the fellas from Michigan. Zo- zooming into town to try to give dear Notre Dame the old one-two. Tune in Saturday to support <laughs> your boys and see if Kelly can make men out of them yet. Rah, rah. Sorry. I My plan was to keep talking so you couldn't fit that in, but you always uh, find a way. Yeah. Yep. I have pages. Like I used to look up really disgusting words, adjectives for our, our uh, Patriot League rundown, the drum and fife. Mm. But now it's just 1940s slang. <laughs> it's all my com- my computer is going to crash because it is overloaded with 1940s slang. Sorry. Let's get back uh, to the event. What I wanted to really ask you is if you saw the note we got. And I honestly don't remember if it's Twitter or Facebook or just through plain old fashioned email. Did you see the question that was asking if we are more restrained when we're watching games by ourselves? Like if we don't have a crowd around us, uh, do we still yell at the TV? Do we still stand up? Are we still gyrating in any capacity when we're watching these 
these big games featuring our own teams by ourselves. I, I'll st- I'll definitely stand up alone for big plays, and I'll you know I'll, I'll do that surrender cobra look where I'm just like yeah. frozen watching this huge moment. I will do that 100 percent alone. I will stand up just to sort of get in a new position. I will I won't yell, but I will audibly be disappointed if something poor happens during an Oregon game. Which past couple of years, a lot of groaning. Yeah, it's been um, rough. But yes, the answer to your question is, even when alone, I will act like a an emotional human. I, I find it incomprehensible that the answer to this for anybody, any true college football fan, would be no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because solid wife Kate's come home to me in a, like a fetal position four inches from the TV before. Too. Yeah. During Notre Dame games, I'm going to watch this one, I think, with Mama H. Do you think Mama H has the, the same things running through her head? Like, I can't embarrass myself in front of Ty. I care way too much. There's a possibility, but being so she is my mother and is forced to love me at all cost, Mm -hmm. she understands my idiosyncrasies while watching Notre Dame football. So if I ask her on a whim to switch chairs (laughs) or to just kind of play into my natural superstitions, she's always willing to do that. And so is solid wife Kate, by the way. For what it's worth. We had we had a, a suggestion and you made a selection for our, our brew club. Yeah. Um, so like do you when do you coordinate with Mama H for like a really nice sherry when you watch these games? Just a little <laughs> sipping sherry. Right. Anything like that? Uh, just strong, strong beer. <laughs> a little cognac. Okay. No, it'll it will be stronger than the suggestion. Okay. We'll Let's talk about football. Bit. So, okay, Dan. Where do you come down on this game? This is the most week one game of week one to me because I could use convention, my conventional wisdom, maybe not everybody else's that like, okay, Notre Dame should have a pretty good, if not good defense. And they're playing at home. They were underdogs early on. They were what? Two and a half point dogs, something like that chunk of the summer and and August. And all of a sudden that's sort of flipped. Maybe that has a little something to do with Tariq black. I don't know, or just where the money's coming in from, but there is we we don't know anything about Shea Patterson within this pretty West Coasty offense yeah. that Jim kind Harbaugh of like runs. A, kind of like a spread quarterback, right? Coming up to run more of a pro style West Coasty sort of his thing. experience is such both in in high school and at Ole Miss these past couple of years. And I recently rewatched all of the offensive snaps of that that Cal game. So week one on the road, what does Shea Patterson look like? And boy, was he good for a quarter and a half. And then, boy, did he do nothing and freak out at the blitz for the next two and a half quarters. So there is a part of me that says, that's a wide open offense with maybe the best receiving core in the country. And they just couldn't do anything against an actually decent Cal defense. Not bad, not great. But he's going to Notre Dame Stadium. It's a little bit different than playing Cal. And his pass catchers are okay. Nothing like Ole Miss had last year. And his line, not as good as Ole Miss is probably in protecting the quarterback. He was protected last year pretty well. What does he look like against this Notre Dame team that on all three levels has more talent than a couple of teams that he struggled with last year? That's the ultimate week one thing about Michigan, that Shea Patterson could look really good by the end of the month. But starting out at Notre Dame with new verbiage, new playbook, new relationships with players and coaches. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of new to go into a big game at a a pretty tough place to play. On Notre Dame's side, yeah, yeah. woof, they're starting Brandon Wimbush. Well, so it's funny that you mentioned that with Shea Patterson, and I talked about this with some folks at at the live show. In Mm -hmm. many aspects, Michigan and Notre Dame are like identical cousins. Because the the previews kind of write themselves. On the Michigan mm-hmm. side, I think they will be uh, either limited or accelerated by the play of the quarterback position. In this case, mm-hmm. Shea Patterson. The same holds true for Notre Dame. So much of it comes down to the quarterback spot. Can we just start referring to Notre Dame's quarterback position like they do with celebrity couples? It's Brandon Wimbush. It's Ian Book. Why not just Wimbook? Do you think Ian Book will play in this game? I would bet in, I would bet dollars to donuts on it. Yes. In a a situation that with the game on the line, like it's 14-10 in the middle of the second quarter kind of thing. Oh, here comes Ian Book. There are going to be multiple scenarios this year. And I say this not as a sarcastic or self-loathing Notre Dame fan. I say this because mm-hmm. I honestly believe it. 
We saw it near the end of the season last year. There are going to be multiple instances this year where it feels like Notre Dame's offense isn't firing on all cylinders. And the announcers are going to start asking the question. And any Notre Dame fan who's paid any amount of attention to the team is going to start asking the question, does Kelly go to book now? Is this time for the quick hook? This Mm -hmm. is going to be a recurring theme. That's why I drafted it. And I'm telling you, get behind (laughs) Wimbook now. Wimbook. Just call it Wimbook. Don't try to delineate between the two. It's going to be a recurring theme. I hear you. Yeah. Who's replacing Josh Adams? That to me seems more important. Dexter Williams is supposedly suspended for the first four games. It's kind of like the oh. quietest suspension in the history of Notre Dame football. So okay. who knows if he plays or not? Again, it's been somewhat of an open question, but I think we see a lot of Tony Jones Jr. I think we see some Jafar Armstrong. Pete Sampson did a good job for the athletic in his mailbag talking about uh, you know, like what is the template for this game? Will it mirror what we saw? In the Georgia game a year ago when Brandon Wimbush got a bunch of carries, he sort of got equal time with Josh Adams. So it's an open question, and that to me is a little bit concerning. Do you know the last time Michigan scored a touchdown in South Bend? Hmm. I believe it was 2010. Wow. It's a long time ago, (laughs) Ty. That's an awful long time Think about what has changed in your life and the world. Did you know Solid Wife Kate in 2010? I was just getting to know Solid Waste Kate then. Hey. Yeah. Um, I definitely didn't know Jody with an eye in 2010. So it's been a bit. Um, the rivalry is back on, which is great. And I like that. I'm a little bit more scared of Brandon Wimbush throwing into Michigan because of that secondary, because of that linebacking core, Kalik Hudson. Yeah. I, I'm a little bit more scared of that, but it's hard for me to envision a Michigan team firing on all cylinders on the road in week one against good defense. So I think I'm going to go Notre Dame here and I need you to hear me, Ty. Okay. I need you to listen to my words. Yeah. Lock of the week. Lock of the week. You, my friend are a jerk. I do not appreciate that (laughs) sentiment at all. I am, I'm going to come down form on the other side of this coin. Because I have more confidence in Michigan's defense than any other unit on the field. I think it poses a real problem for Wimbook and Notre Dame. Uh, We still don't really know who's getting the carries, as I mentioned a few seconds ago. And I think Michigan's line, their defensive line, could, could cause trouble for a Notre Dame line that's still really good, but probably learning to play in week one without its two top 10 picks from a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, did you see the article in the athletic about Rashawn Gary and the contact lenses? Oh my God. Not only did I see the article, I met the author a couple weeks ago at a, a live like Q and a oh, really? sesh show with our pal, Nicole Auerbach, Cody Stavenhagen. Great last name. Yeah. Cody Stavenhagen should be starting at left guard for Wisconsin. Absolutely. <laughs> with that name. Um, yes, I did see the thing on Rashawn Gary. I am always confounded, dumbfounded, whatever the the wording should be when an athlete is like, oh yeah, I can't really see, but I perform at an elite level regardless. Yeah. And Rashawn Gary wears glasses. He is a glasses wearing person and he has not worn them during football games for some time. And Cody Stavenhagen, who covers Michigan for The Athletic, does a great job, wrote about both the fact that, hey, Rashawn Gary has contacts. That'll probably make him better. Two, he stopped eating ice cream and lost a bunch of weight or lost a bunch of fat, but is now just built ridiculously and has fewer pieces of baby cow milk sludge in his body. I like ice cream. I apologize. But the cool thing is also about this piece is he goes way back to New Jersey with Brandon Wimbush. Wimbush, that's right. Yeah. And there's a little bit of salt left over. Sean Gary doesn't have a, a high school, a, a state title in New Jersey because of Brandon Wimbush. So Whoa. I was I, I I really like this piece a lot. It gave me sort of a new look into this matchup. I think our deal is still valid, by the way. If anyone wants to jump in, we've again heard great things from people who have jumped in on the athletic. If you mm-hmm. go to theathletic.com slash solid verbal you can get 40 percent off your first year subscription it's pennies it's great college football coverage you get stories about kids who have trouble putting contacts in their eyes that's how in depth this is great with I, who can't relate to that i actively read this story and i was like man i really want Rashawn gary to 
for no reason. <laughs> I'm not a Michigan fan. It's fine if Michigan's good. I want him to dominate even more than everybody thought he would. Yeah. Because then after the season, like, what changed? And he was like, oh, I could see what was I could see. On the yeah. Field. <laughs> it made a big difference. Now, the, the Athletic and, and Cody does a great job for the Michigan uh, beat on uh, on theathletic.com slash solid verbal. $2.99 a month. Come on. Check it out. Read, the read athletic, sports. That's a, they're meant to be read. Theathletic.com slash solid verbal. Pull the trigger. I'm I'm going Michigan here. I think it's close. I think it's hard fought. I think a, a defensive play is the difference. They win on the road 24 to 20. And they march forward, Dan, into potentially the college football playoff. I will say, in I'm defense of your pick. Yeah. I, I cannot, I'm not acknowledging that second part of your sentence. But they did against a team, a big team, away from home with questionable at best quarterback play last year with the Felipe Franks and Mm. Malik Zaire and Florida and Dallas. They looked good. They won that game comfortably and their defense led the way. So it's not exactly the same, but it's there are parallels. I have more confidence in Michigan's defense. The other thing I'd say is that it is bad luck for me to pick Notre Dame. By God, some people in some people in Chicago told me that I I dare not even consider picking Notre Dame in this game. Okay, so, but this is how I feel. We disagree. Let's go to Saturday night on ABC, eight p.m. They're playing this one in Camping World Stadium in Orlando, Florida. We've got the Louisville Cardinals Louisville. versus the Alabama Crimson Tide. Alabama is a hefty favorite by twenty five points. In this game, Dan, Fumfun Swanzik, as the Germans would say. Huh. Okay, I'll take your word for it. So let's talk about Louisville's questions entering this season. Whoa. The the most obvious is how they're going to replace Lamar Jackson, right? Mm-hmm. Like the best player in school history and all that. There is not a straightforward answer. Offensively, they'll still probably be pretty solid. I'm excited to see Puma pass. Bobby Petrino knows how to coach offense, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. Mm -hmm. The second question, though, is how do you fix a defense that regressed to 84th in the country, Dan? Now, when you have a defense that's 84th nationally, according to the S&P Plus, a metric that we know and love, there are many solutions out there, Dan. What was was the one that Bobby (laughs) Petrino settled on here? Uh, My notes indicate it is... Somebody named Brian Van Gorder. Brian Van Gorder. I got to say, this is not the solution I was expecting, Dan. Yeah. I mean, Brian Van Gorder was good for a little bit, right? When he got to Notre Dame? I, I, yeah, I sort of. Um, yeah. Didn't they, like, murder Texas in his first game? Yeah, but Texas was garbage that year. I just, I'm facts only here, Ty. This is like ordering the cheap charging cables from Amazon and hoping they work with your iPhone. <laughs> is this? Are you saying Brian Van Gorder is the H and M hire? <laughs> Maybe I don't know of the off season because that is so mean, Ty. <laughs> These pants are going to last this time, H and M. I believe in you. <laughs> okay. Oh man, twenty five is a big number. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you, how do you feel about a? scenario here for Alabama where they cover well first of all it doesn't matter it does matter that it's Brian Van Gorder I suppose but it doesn't ultimately matter because it's what three defensive coordinators in three years right for Bobby Petrino Grantham Peter Sermon and and now BVG I am not at all worried about Louisville's offense in this game sort of yes <laughs> but right. just big picture with Louisville if they get anything from Jawan Pass they have one of the best, if not the best, receiving core. Uh, well, I wouldn't say in the ACC, but it's top level. Jalen Smith and Des Fitzpatrick, both really good. I like their offensive line. Mackay Becton, I think, was one of my my dudes when we were previewing the ACC. Hey, look, I mean, this is a newish Alabama defense, right? The secondary is basically new. Up front, there's experience, but it's not returning what they've returned in years past in terms of high level, obvious high level NFL talent. Maybe by the end of the season, it will be. Yeah, there's a little bit of an opening here. I don't know if Louisville is going to face a shutdown defense like it will be a shutdown defense inevitably by the time we get to week 10 with Alabama. But uh, and if you're going to if you're going to pick apart Alabama, Ty, 
they basically replace their entire coaching staff. <laughs> <laughs> also true. They lose both coordinators, and granted, they it's a promotion to Tosh Lupoy to uh, to defensive coordinator, and you know they it's sort of filling in. You know, Josh Gaddis comes in from Penn State to be a co coordinator on offense with a, a couple of different minds, I suppose. But um, Mike Loxley being one of them, which is not my <laughs> like most favorite thing, sure. but this team is ultimately coached by Nick Saban. And I could see Louisville starting this game out with scripted plays really well, taking advantage of really good receivers and the line giving Jawan Pass some time. But I'm not confident in this Louisville defense. I, you know, whoever ends up starting, it's probably going to be Tua. I just am guessing here. Their running back core just doesn't end. We saw no. Najee Harris in the national championship game, and that was just a glimmer tie that was just the very beginning of Najee Harris and what he's going to do for Alabama the receiving core is rebuilt a little without Calvin Ridley but I just Alabama is going to crock pot the hell out of Louisville and it could be like 15 13 at halftime and 41 13 at the end of the game that kind of thing so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take Alabama to crock pot this situation I can't play the sound until it happens Okay, That's a general fair. rule of thumb. But that is do, my guess. If we do get a crockpotting, look, Alabama crockpots everybody. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. just, that's their MO. There's a really good chance here that Alabama rushes for like 300 yards on the ground. Yeah. Because their line is going to bully and wear Louisville down over the course of 60 minutes. Whoa. The Harris Ranch is going to have a field day here. <laughs> Damien and Najee are going to run for an eternity. Uh, I am curious to see how Louisville's offense fares against what will still be a top-level defense, even if they've got less experience than usual. But I don't see a great path to covering the point spread here. I thought about locking this one up, but 25 is a lot in week one where both teams are going to be working through filling out some of their own gaps here in the two deep. By the way, speaking of two deeps, I don't know if you saw, but it did seem on Alabama's like they're going to play both Jalen Hurts as well as Tuatunga Vialoa. To a tongue of Iowa. in this football game. So I'm curious as well to see how Nick Saban plays that scenario where he's got two high level quarterbacks. But let's go Alabama here to win and cover the spread. I'll say something like 38 to 10. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stick with my 41 13 off the, the sort of top of my head. Okay, so we agree. We agree. Moving on. Let's go to Sunday night, Dan. Sunday night football here. Mm hmm. In the world of college football, they're playing this one at AT&T Stadium, 7.30 Sunday evening on ABC. We've got the Miami Hurricanes squaring off against the LSU Tigers. The point spread is three and a half in favor of the Canes. Let me start with the good news here. The, the good news that both these defenses are going to be a ton of fun. Yeah. Miami forced something crazy like, was it 31 turnovers? Did I see that correctly? They did, and they were turning teams over. They were winning. That's why the turnover chain was a thing. It's going to be back out there again this year, and the mentality, I would imagine, is going to be the same. I wouldn't bet on there being another 31 turnovers because that's a lot to ask and requires luck to be on their side two years running. However, yeah. still an aggressive attacking mentality Ooh. on that defense. Yeah, And on the flip side, LSU is going to be loaded, too. They are. They've got Devin White. They've got our boy Greedy Williams, who we mm-hmm. both love. They still got Dave Aranda, who should field another elite defense. All all good points. I think you're right about the defense. They Miami does replace a good amount up front. Though those guys have rotated in a lot, and Gerald Willis should be good. Um, it's one of those situations where one, I expect LSU fans to outnumber Miami fans pretty dramatically yeah, in this right. game. I don't think it makes a huge, huge difference, but if we don't have consistent quarterback play on either side, then suddenly red zone stuff and false start penalties, false starts, whatever, special teams, the just ug- not ugliness, but the the things that we don't immediately point to as being keys suddenly become key oh, and that's sure. what i that's what i see happening here and i think my confidence in this lsu defense is a little bit higher that they can win without turnovers and they will turn over teams and i'm worried about them on offense and the 
inability to see an immediate game breaker in the backfield, like yeah. we've been able to say with Darius Geis, uh, and just year over year, guy after guy for LSU. I don't see that this year. So in that type of game, I think I'm just going to go with LSU. I think take the points. to me, that speed, those points, I think not only am I going to take the points, I think they win outright. There is something troubling to me about Malik Rozier being in a situation not dissimilar to what Brandon Wimbush was in. We're like, should he be again? <laughs> is that what we're, are we rolling this? Okay. Um, in that type of situation against an LSU defense that should be very good in, in a much healthier place than they were last year. So I'm taking LSU outright, something like 20 to 16. Ugly, but a win is a win. Okay. I, I disagree, actually. I'm going to go Miami 20 to 14. Uh, LSU loses me on offense. And I know they've named Joe Burrow the starter now, the transfer from Ohio State. We've called him Joe Dirt, as you know. Mm -hmm. He could be really good, or maybe he won't be. Mm -hmm. Uh, The LSU offense on the whole around him is less experienced. This is like the first time in forever that it feels like the running back position is such an unknown quantity, like you mentioned there. And that bothers me because we know the brand of offense that Steve Ensminger wants to run. Toughness. Don't yeah, I just don't know who the rushing game is going to be based on, which concerns me. LSU is also really young. They released their two deep earlier this week on like Monday. And they're going to have perhaps more than eight sophomore starters for just the second time since 1986. So there's a youth movement going on. This is a big game. As I said at the top of our previews, this is the kind of team that could go seven and five and be way better than their record because the schedule is just downright brutal. I'm going in on the Canes this year. Not enamored with Malik Rozier, but if the offense is healthier around him, if the defense can play to uh, somewhat of the same level, I think it goes a long way. I like them more in a big game. I think they got more big game experience from last season. So give me the Canes to win by 620 to 14 in a, in a defensive struggle slugfest kind of game, low scoring 20 to 14. Okay. We just agree. And finally, among our big feature games, before we get into some other odds and ends here, Monday Night Football, 8 p.m. on ESPN, we've got a conference game, an early conference game in the Mm -hmm. ACC between Virginia Tech and Florida State. They're playing this one in Tallahassee. The point spread is seven and a half in favor of the Knowles. Willie Taggart did announce this week that he's going to go with DeAndre Francois to be his starting quarterback. This quarterback race was sort of in doubt between Francois and James Blackman for a while. I was never enamored with James Blackman. I'm no FSU expert, but he looked dreadful to me in the games I saw last season. Mm -hmm. He got his opportunity, of course, because Francois got hurt very early on. Uh, Tough draw for Virginia Tech going on the road here, Dan. How do you you feel? Yeah. First and foremost... Willie Taggart getting his dream job. Feel good story of the off season. <laughs> sure. Oh, sorry, of last season. Right. Um, so I would probably with Florida State being overhauled coaching staff wise and just scheme wise and sort of starting from from square run square one. I w- might have looked at the consistency, the usual consistency of Virginia Tech, especially on defense. You know, retaining Bud Foster and seemingly always having. Um, one of two families on that defense, <laughs> either a fuller or generally just fullers on that defense. But right. um, I really don't like how Virginia Tech ended the year last year on offense. They averaged like 15 or 16 points a game from November on. And defensively, they're replacing a lot with no obvious guys waiting in the wings. And it hasn't been like that for a long time in Blacksburg. So to go on the road with as much juice and excitement as there will be in Tallahassee and at Doak on Monday night. I I think Cam Akers runs kind of wild. I, I think yeah, Virginia okay. Tech will eventually be okay, but I think there is just I think things are going to snowball for Florida State. And I think they win by double digits here. Something like thirty four to seventeen or something. I, I think I could see it. Yeah. I think the Knowles look good. I really do. And DeAndre Francois, while he certainly has his limitations. I I don't think they're going to have to rely on him all that much. This defense should be good. It should be fast. Um, it should be played played 
it should be, they should be, <laughs> I'm losing my English, uh, they should be playing with a, a renewed level of vigor. Yeah. So I am going with Florida State here, comfortable 34 to 17 at home. The one pick that I will not live down from our previews was predicting that Florida State was going to go seven and five. And it's still possible, mm-hmm. right? It's absolutely possible. But it's just like the more you look at this team and how young they are and how talented they still are, it's not like Jimbo Fisher left the cupboard bare. They've got a lot of high caliber players on that team. Uh, I, I second guess myself in that regard. I agree with you here. I really like Florida State. The tech defense worries me a lot. I love Bud Foster, but I don't know if he's got enough wizardry, at least not in week one, to put something together that can stop what, as you mentioned, is a really good ground attack led by Cam Akers. Uh, Florida State's going to have bumps here and there, but they are not short on talent and not nearly short enough in a game like this to lose at home when they've got pretty much the entire spotlight of the nation. So I don't know the final score, but I think Florida State wins this one comfortably, maybe by like 17 at home. That's what I said. covers the spread. We agree. We do. We fully agree. Okay. Um, Before we go any further, two things we must mention, Dan. Here we go. Look, it it is going to be Labor Day weekend. You're going to be out at the game. If you're not Mm -hmm. at the game, you're probably going to be watching the game with other friends. Yep. Don't even think about drunk driving. Don't even think about being drug impaired when you operate a motor vehicle. We don't want our verballers getting in crashes. We don't want people getting hurt or killed. Please just take a moment to think about it before you even contemplate operating a motor vehicle. The stats point to just an alarming amount of people who die every day in some sort of alcohol impaired crash. I don't mean to be Debbie Downer here, but that's like, I think I saw one person every 50 minutes. It is not worth it. If you feel different, you drive different. If you drive high, you get a DUI. Please drive sober. Don't risk getting pulled over. Just be safe out there, Verballers. We appreciate you downloading our show, listening to us when we're when you're in the car. Uh, by all means, be safe out there. Okay? Ride-sharing services, super easy. Yep. Reasonably priced. Friends, free if they're not drinking. Super free to give you a ride. Take advantage. Don't be dumb. And also, if you are in the car this weekend, if you're looking for another podcast or group of podcasts that might suit your fancy, we just wanted to mention our good friends over at NFL Podcasts. Yeah. Okay, if you're looking for NFL coverage, you can get latest news from around the league from the Around the NFL podcast crew, which has exclusive access to industry insiders and team personnel, which allows you, the listener, to feel like you're in on all of the action. Or if you'd like to hear more of your favorite players and analysts break things down both on and off the field, don't miss out on Dave Damashak and his football program as he and his guests operate a strict no-jive policy, only honest, unfiltered opinions. Or if you want something more devoted then the average NFL fan, check out our good friend Daniel Jeremiah, a noted verballer. He oh, hosts yeah. the Move the Sticks podcast. He's in on that show as well as Bucky Brooks, who's a name I'm sure most people are familiar with. And as the NFL preseason continues to heat up, make sure you follow along with NFL podcast to build your own set of bold predictions and insights into who might be the next star. Subscribe now to Around the NFL, the Dave Damashak football program and move the sticks on your favorite podcast app or by going on out to nfl.com dan just did a little research and they have a season starting soon as well absolutely okay rapid fire let's get into it also on saturday at high noon on fs1 it is texas traveling east to square off against maryland texas is a 13 and a half point road favorite it's not a true road game because they're playing it at FedEx Field in Landover, but for all Mm -hmm. intents and purposes, it's pretty much a road game for the Horns, Dan. Um, I don't know how the situation at Maryland isn't going to be a huge distraction for those kids, but I am not going to turn my back on them now because I was real fired up about their potential in my previews. I think Texas wins because I always like Texas to win, but it's a weird spot for both teams. I think... Texas wins, but Maryland covers here. Maybe a closer game that might meet the eye. 
yeah, these players had nothing to do with the uh, the gross stuff that's being alleged with uh, the Maryland situation. So hope the players are are able to play well and do right by themselves and their each other. I suppose. Uh, yeah, I I think Texas wins this game. I don't know about how comfortably they win this game. I, this is probably going to be as good as Maryland is all year as they transition once again to a new offense as Matt Canada takes over in a, an interim role with DJ Durkin sideline. So I am, uh, I'm actually going to take the points here. I think yeah, Maryland loses, but a eight or nine point loss, something like uh 30 to 21. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. Also Saturday, high noon on ESPN. It is Ole Miss versus Texas tech. Texas mm. Tech is a two-point favorite. They're playing this one in the NERG, Dan. <laughs> NRG Stadium in Houston. Fair to say we're going to see something of a shootout. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this whoever has the ball last wins? It, quite possibly. Um, yeah, this game will be probably pretty fun. Jordan Ta'amu and I think McLean Carter is probably going to get the nod for Texas Tech at quarterback. So Ta'amu and... Carter, good quarterback battle. Uh, Ole Miss should be able to get behind this Texas Tech defense, but they should also be able to not stop <laughs> this yeah. uh, this Texas Tech offense. So, in a shootout, I'm I'm going to take the points. What's what? Two and a half? Two? Two and a half? I got two. Two at two at uh, present time of recording. And that's Texas Tech being favored. Yeah, right. I'm going to take these points. I'm going to go with Ole Miss. And if you're going to the NERG, if you're going to be in Houston. I would go to Hugo's for nicer Mexican and Pinkerton's for barbecue if you want to okay. stay in the city of Houston. I think whoever has the ball last wins. I'm going to take Ole Miss because Texas Tech's defense uh, just has to be the worst unit on the field. <laughs> I don't know. It's probably not fair, but that feels like it's the same answer yeah. every year. So give me fair. Ole Miss. I'm with or you. Not. We agree. We agree. Next. Saturday, 3.30, CBS, another neutral site game. Yeah, yeah. Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte, North Carolina. The Tennessee Volunteers, led by new coach Jeremy Pruitt, squaring off against the West Virginia Mountaineers. West Virginia, the ears favored by 10 points. Dan, neutral site game. Who you got? Oh, West Virginia. (laughs) I definitely have West Virginia in this game. Um, Tennessee's offense won't be good enough to take advantage of West Virginia's defensive liabilities. So... Yeah, give me the ears, and it's probably a little back and forth early, but ultimately, I think Dana Holgerson calls a better game than what Jeremy Pruitt will be able to to mount with the talent on defense for Tennessee right now. Yeah, so right. I'm going. I'm going Dub V here, and if you're in Charlotte, I said it before for the I think the ACC championship game. Go to Futo Futo Buddha F U T O B U T A. Grab some ramen. Grab some fried Brussels sprouts. You will be happy. Yeah, Tennessee's front seven doesn't bother me, uh, but they're secondary against a team yeah. like West Virginia. That's that's problematic. They'll also probably be below average on offense. That doesn't seem like so. a stretch to me. No. It's going to be a bit of a rebuild for Jeremy Pruitt, and that rebuild is going to take more than one off season. So they'll get yeah. there, I think, but it's not going to be there yet, and certainly not going to be there enough to contain the Will Greer to David Sills combination that I expect we'll see a lot of this season. So give me West Virginia to win and cover the point spread here. I have no confidence that Tennessee is ever going to get there. Yeah. Okay. As long as Kirby Smart is at Georgia. Also, uh, two Big Ten teams in action that we Mm -hmm. should mention here. We've got Oregon State on the road at Ohio State. Ohio State, a 37-point favorite. We've also got Penn State in action mid-afternoon at home on Big Ten Network against App State. They are a 23-point favorite here. We talked about how Oregon State traveling to Columbus early was a form of cruel and unusual punishment for Mm -hmm. a team that just won one game from a year ago. And also, I know you're pretty high on App State. So if you're watching a game, which one of these two are you more interested in? Penn State, App State, okay. for sure. I, I want to see, you know, what Miles Sanders looks like. I want to see, you know, if Justin Shorter gets in there. I want to see what he looks like because Penn State is playing Ohio State and has more questions at the end of the month. So uh, I'm looking at Penn State and what they look like on offense, replacing some key guys. Ohio State 
is going to quickly and efficiently lay waste to Oregon State. But I think there's more to care about as the game goes on with Penn State, App State. But don't be fooled by the name App State and opening weekend in the Big Ten. And I think this game is on BTN. Yep. Penn State's going to beat App State by 30. Yeah. Is there any reason to think Oregon State's going to cover 37 against Ohio State? That's a lot of points. No, I don't. I, I tried. No. Not even a distraction factor for Ohio State. No urban mind. No, I think I think the fact that this is the distraction yeah, right. is going to be a positive thing for Ohio State. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm real curious to see how Penn State's defense, lo- defense looks. Excuse me. Maybe beyond week one. I don't know if App State's the And there's best no Manny Bowen, right? He is once no. again off the team. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's. I mean, that's significant. It is. Absolutely. He was the anchor of that defense returning. Yeah. We've also got on Big Ten Network, I believe, Northern Illinois against Iowa. Iowa I'm is I'm taking a those points, Ty. 10-point favorite here, really? I Oh, my gosh, yes. Week one, Iowa, which I know they were really good against Wyoming, but um, yes, I think NIU's defense, I don't think NIU's going to win outright, but there, there has to be one of these games, right? Not one of these Big Ten-specific games, but one of these G5, Power 5 games in the afternoon is going to be the like, uh, you should be flipping to BTN because it's 23 20 with two minutes left. And I think that's going to be this game. I think Sutton Smith and this NIU defense, even with the new coordinator, they return too much that if they take away plan a for Iowa, I'm not super confident. In Iowa's offense. I, I love Nate Stanley. We talked about it during the live show. Plenty. Yeah. But I think this is the matchup. I think this is the time. It's during the day. There's just, there's something about NIU. I'm going with, uh, I'm going with them. I'm going with Rod Carey's crew to, uh, to cover this game. I'm going Nate Stanley or bust here. Okay. Give me mm-hmm. Iowa minus the points. Yeah. All right. Saturday, 4 p.m. on Fox, Dan, mm-hmm. North Carolina, traveling to Cal. Do you know what we call that 60 minutes, Dan? Uh, uh, what what do we call it? We call it the Bauer Hour. <laughs> Officially, he was he did have to be named. He did have to be named, but Ross Bauer is your starting quarterback for the Cal Golden Bears. They are at home in a seven point favorite. UNC, you may have read at the beginning of August, they suspended thirteen players, which will not bode well for the Tar Heels in this football game. I like Cal. I like them at home. I like them to cover the point spread. I like Cal as well. Uh, Nathan, Nate Elliott, whatever, looked pretty good near the end of the season. And Anthony Ratliff Williams is quite possibly this year's, you know, Duke of Hazard, Alan Lazard, or Eric Decker, any of those guys who are just amazing receivers on below average teams. I don't think it's going to be enough. I like Cal here by uh, by like 11 or 12. Saturday at 6 p.m. on ESPN News. Oh, okay. Sure. Hmm. All right, Boise at Troy. The Broncos are a 10.5 point road favorite. I can't say I ever remember a game on ESPN News being a thing, but (laughs) this should be a good game. I am all in on Boise this year. I think they will truly be the best group of five team in the country because their entire team, virtually their entire team is back from a year ago. It is a tough early spot, but in Boise, I generally trust I think they win. I think they cover here. I disagree. So the game is in Troy, Alabama. It's not yes. particularly close to Boise, uh, Idaho. And this was a 10 or 11 point game last year with Boise winning at home. I think the Trojans make this game weird. And mostly because I, with some of these games, I'm trying to find something. I'm trying to find that nug, Ty. And the nug I found is it's going to be damp and humid and hot. Mm. It's, it's, thunderstormy and during the afternoon so we could have a slightly muddy field whoa troy had a top 20 defense last year they replaced a little bit up front and more importantly they have to replace brandon silvers their starting quarterback but i there's something about boise early on they lose what that triple overtime game to wazoo last year they lose to virginia big in september they're another grower rather than shower show on the road are we saying yako's home dog of the week here i am going Yakko's home dog of the week. The Yakko's home dog of the week. Wow. 
Yeah, Troy Trojans. Got to go to the group of five to find your Yakos home dog, but there it is. Boise, okay. they're going to have a great defense this year. They do, you know, they missed Leighton Van Der Esch, who was extraordinary for them last year. They're going to be very good this year. I think they probably edge them out. I think it's like a 27-24 overtime game. Troy covers. Let's go back in time if we can, Dan. Thursday at 8 p.m. on ESPN. Northwestern, the Wildcats on the road in West Lafayette against the Purdue Boiler Makers. Purdue is a two and a half point favorite here. I must admit I was caught off guard by the point spread. I honestly believe the wrong team is favored in this game. Why? And I, I may or may not have placed some of my own real world American currency on this game. I am feeling saucy in week one. Let's lock up the cats. Lock up. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Why? Let's do it. Going against the, the Sindelarity? I am. It pains me to do this, but... What do you like about Northwestern in September? Speaking of growers and not showers, which, by the way, we're going to get tweets. Yeah, Dan, absolutely. you got to stop with that. Yeah. I, what, what is it that you like about Northwestern? I like Clayton Thorson. Okay. And I hate Purdue's defense. <laughs> last, yeah, year, Purdue's- last year, they, they went places because of their defense. And Jeff Brom really leaned on their defense in spite of an offense that was still growing. Mm-hmm. This year, I think it's going to be the shoe on the other foot, which isn't necessarily the worst way to beat Northwestern, but it feels to me like with Northwestern's veteran leadership on offense, they're going to be able to move the ball on Purdue and score in this defense. I disagree. I do disagree. I mean, Purdue's defense isn't going to be where it was last year, but uh, shout out Nick Holt for that <laughs> turnaround with the Boilermakers. Purdue, Jeff brought me year two, a full summer to prepare against a, a conference foe. Uh, it's at home. I'm going with I'm going with Purdue. I'm not overthinking this. All right. And finally, let's just throw this one out there because it's a rivalry. Friday night, 930 CBS Sports Network. They're playing this one neutral site as you can get between Colorado and Colorado State in Denver at Sports Authority Field. Colorado is a seven and a half point favorite, Dan. Mm -hmm. I swear at one point I saw that Colorado State was favored by 14 and a half, but (laughs) but Colorado State lost at home to Hawaii. They did. They gave up 617 yards. I wonder if, is this the first ever look ahead spot in week zero for Colorado State? (laughs) You know what? Probably not, but I'm not going to say with certainty, Ty. (laughs) The old week zero look ahead. We don't talk much about it, but I think that may be the case here, Dan. Colorado is not going to be particularly good this year. No. And Colorado State can improve. Like, K.J. Carter Samuels had a ridiculous game for, uh, for the Rams. Mike Bobo was just coming back from a pretty scary health incident going into last week. I'm not saying Colorado State's going to be good, and I think they're going to be kind of disappointing on defense. But I don't know. (laughs) I'm going to say Colorado's going to win this game. You said the spread's what? A a touchdown? Seven and a half. Yeah, I think Colorado covers. I do. They return a, a decent enough quarterback. And God, they were bad on defense, though, last year. They could give up a ton. This could be very shootouty, but uh, I'm gosh, steering into I, it. I, I want to take Colorado State, but I saw their defense. Yeah, and they still could improve. You know what? I'm going to go with the Rams. I'm going I'm Rams. Go with the Bobo turnaround here. I the think they Bobo cover. turnaround. Look ahead yeah. in Week Zero. Steer into it, Dan. Couple other notes. You, yeah, please. You neglected San Diego State Stanford. Oh, which sorry. That could. I mean, San Diego State won this game last year. <laughs> they full on won. Yeah. In the in the winning column, San Diego State against Stanford. Stanford's favored by a couple touchdowns with Bryce Love, KJ Costello returning. A bunch of questions on defense, but still a lot of talent there. San Diego State, no more Rashad Penny, who replaced Donnell Pumphrey. And there's now Jawan Washington as the dude. Um, I think this game is is fine. I think San Diego State covers. Sure, Stanford's not a tough place to play. No. Give me the Tex. Okay. I don't know if people call them the Tex. Um, otherwise, game-wise, nothing 
particularly, I mean, JT Daniels gets his first start. He should still be in middle school, remember? That's right. Against UNLV. So you should at least watch the highlights, see how he looks playing college football. Um, TCU has Southern Oregon. My my beautiful, beautiful Oregon Ducks play Bowling Green. Right. And Mario Cristobal's first non-interim head coaching situation for the Ducks. Um Anything else, Ty, that jumps out to you as just you have the civil conflict, yeah, UCF, right. UConn, right? Josh Heupel, anything is that is that moving your needle? <laughs> the turnover plank with Kennesaw State, Georgia State. You love that turnover plank, don't you? I do like the turnover plank. It is it is very nice and and, and it's creative. We got Wake Forest, Tulane. The Sam Hartman era begins taking over for the Wolford Wagon. How does yeah. Wake look against Willie Fritz and the the sort of pseudo option? We've got no. Adrian Martinez and Nebraska kicking off the Scott Frost era against Akron at home on that, Saturday night. That game has all the makings of, oh, wow, Nebraska won 45 to 20. <laughs> Is Nebraska already good? You and are And then two correct. weeks later, n- no, no, they're not. Yep. But yes, that's, that's what Army Duke, I think, could be secretly kind of fun. Army yep. won this game last year. So that's a thing. Going to get to see Felipe Franks in the Dan Mullen era. He was named starter down there in Gainesville. They've got Charleston Southern, I believe, on Saturday night. Curious to see how that offense takes shape. That's going to take some time, Ty. Yeah, it will. The Florida offense, it's going to take a minute. Yeah. Um, anybody else? I think that's it for me. That's everything? Yeah, I think no so. No other storylines. No Austin P. Georgia thoughts? Not really. No. Nothing. No. Yeah, Ty, I guess if there is literally nothing else, yeah. I'm going to make a request. Oh, please. Would you please, for the first time in many, many months, yeah. drop that big, stanky, writhing, Ooh. sensually veiny Ooh. drum and fife? Oh, yeah, the season. Is finally upon us. Let's talk some Patriot League, Dan. Do I know what sensually veiny means? Does anybody? I do not. But here is your quick Patriot League preview. The media feels Colgate is going to finish atop the Patriot League. And to that I say nay. (laughs) 11 first place votes. Colgate's going to be really good this year, actually. But I still say nay. Because I am siding, Ty. I'm going to go with Fordham here. Okay. Fordham being overlooked once again. New York's one true team. Lehigh between the two of them in the media poll. Right. But it's it's going to be a woeful year for Georgetown. Lafayette, rebuilding year. Everybody's been talking about it. The message boards are a buzz. Yep, yep. Rebuilding year for the Yetis. Bucknell, you're a joke. We know you're a joke. Ty saw your campus and he said nay. No. Yeah. So there's a lot to like about this Patriot League season. We were talking earlier on, on Gchat, Ty. You... Don Bragalone, you think he's one of the ultimate underrated running backs on the FCS level. Totally, yeah. Mr. Lehigh, uh, the Colgate up front defensive line, Nick Wheeler. You don't want you don't want Nick Wheeler in a in a dark alley tie. That's what everybody's been saying. <laughs> All right, that Colgate secondary tie. Here are the games for this. Alec week, Wisniewski, then. Tyler Castillo, twelve thirty, Saint Francis at Lehigh. I am bound by marriage to go with the Lehigh Mountain Hawks in this game, Dan. Where are they playing this one? This time? one's at Lehigh, at Goodman Stadium. So I'm seeing this is at Soccer City in Joburg is actually the asterisk I'm seeing here. <laughs> Soccer City hosting Lehigh week one. Okay. I'm going to... Who's Lehigh playing again? I was too Saint busy Francis. looking at the biggest soccer stadiums. Uh, St. Francis, PA? Sure. Okay. I'm going Lehigh here. 1 p.m. Georgetown away from Multisport Field going to Marist. Who do you got? I feel like Marist is in the Poughkeepsie area. Yeah, upstate New York. Yeah. You said Georgetown. Let's go with G-Town here. I think you could mess around with Marist a little. Absolutely. I'm going to go Marist. Get out of here, Marist. 1 p.m., Holy Cross, the Crossaders on the road at Colgate. This is is in the Toron Arena in Krakow, Poland. (laughs) (laughs) Ty, I got to say, I'm learning so much on this Wikipedia page for largest indoor arenas by capacity. (laughs) Give me Colgate. I am learning a lot. I'm going lot. Colgate. Yeah, I'm going Gators big here. All right. This one's on ESPN Plus, 6 p.m. on Saturday. Fordham at Charlotte. 
Charlotte's a joke. Give me the Rams. All day, all night, give me Fordham. All right, I'm going to go Charlotte. And finally, <laughs> we've got William and Mary at Bucknell, 6 p.m. on oh. Saturday evening. Both Bill and Mary. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with the Nellies here. There's something about Pat League pride early, Ty. It fills me to my gills. I'm going with Bucknell. I go Bill and Mary. Things. I go Bill and Mary. I detest Bucknell. You know this. <sighs> Lafayette Sacred Heart. Do I even have to ask? <laughs> Do I even have to ask, Tyler? Uh, I got to go. I got to go Lafayette there. The drive begins in earnest. Yeah. Lafayette big over Sacred Corazon. All right. So what we started doing last year is playing voice messages that we, mm-hmm. we received from our friend Adam Amin. Adam Amin's been a growing part of this program with good reason. One of our favorite friends out there in sports media. And he travels a lot because he's one of the preeminent commentators in the world of college football. Um, he's going to be in Tucson, Arizona this week. And he's got a food recommendation for any folks who might find themselves crossing paths with this him. Is, Have a listen. This is Khalil Tate, BYU. Yes? That is correct. <sighs> Here's Adam's Watch recommendation. That. Hello, Verballers. Smell that? It's the smell of the start of a new college football season and also some kind of pasta with garlic and meatballs. I, I have leftovers, so that that's going to happen in a few minutes. Speaking of which, it's our first voicemail of the season. My partners, Rod Gilmore, Quint Kesnick, and I are headed to Tucson, Arizona for the opening Saturday of the college football season. Arizona, BYU, we hope you'll stay up late for Khalil Tate. That's a rhyme. (laughs) Also, Kevin Sumlin and BYU will be there. But Tucson, Arizona, what are the homes of the Sonoran hot dog? A hot dog wrapped in bacon and grilled, served bolillo style. That's basically served in a savory bread, kind of like Mm -hmm. a variation of a baguette. Maybe like what you use for a torta. And obviously, several places to check it out. Apparently, there are more than 200 places in Tucson to give it a shot. But by recommendation from my good friend Roxy Bernstein of the Pac-12 Network, Baja Cafe. What do I want from Baja Cafe? The Wyatt Earp. Two grilled jalapeno popper tamale cakes over a green chili tomatillo sauce with pulled pork, chipotle bacon, green chilies, onion, tomato, melted cheddar and Monterey Jack cheese, poached eggs, avocado hollandaise, pico de gallo, and queso fresco. And then for dessert, snickerdoodle pancakes. (laughs) I think that's a great starting point for this season. Can't wait for the start of college football this week. ESPN, 1045 Eastern Time, Arizona and BYU were the last game of the day. Talk to you then. Until next time, this has been your solid verbal voicemail. Wow, there you go, Dan. There you go. Wow. I'm mean, on the road. Ty, I got really hungry listening to that. <laughs> well, it is I got re- He said so many delicious words. Absolutely. Do you, What do you know about Sonora, Ty, by the way? Sonora? Before we get into the next part. Yes. Um, the I know Sonoran S- Desert, the state of Sonora within Mexico. Sonoras Moss. Yeah, Sonoras Moss, obviously a major part of That's probably the, state the of extent Sonora. of it. Yeah. So the Sonoran hot dog, as he mentioned, is just a fully dressed, ridiculous hot dog situation. They're amazing. Also, one of my favorite tacos in LA, a place called Sonora Town. Just a quick drop right there, Tom. Yeah. Boom. Sonora, desert state, but filled with an oasis of flavors. Boom. Go with what you're going to say now. And finally, we put out a call on the Sunday show. We needed a solid verb brew, a uh, choice for the solid verbal brew club. Okay. I haven't settled on a name yet. Okay. But we did get a call here from Brett, which I thought was very fitting. And I wanted to play it. He has a beer recommendation for those who are interested. Is he our hot pensive coordinator? Ooh, good one. <laughs> Thank you. That poten- was so bad. I'm ashamed. It's got potential. Okay. Okay. Let's hear it. Hey, Dan and Ty. This is Brett coming at you from the panhandle of Florida, an Oklahoma state transplant in the middle of SEC country. I've got a beer pairing recommendation for week one, and it is Anderson Valley's Summer Solstice. I think it works Ooh. for two reasons. One, because the start of a new season, much like the Summer sol- Solstice, is filled with hopes of new beginnings and of all the things you or your team is going to accomplish in the coming season, when in reality it's going to end up being very, very little. 
And second, because summer solstice being a summer beer uh, will probably be going out of circulation until next year, so this week might be the last time you can find it, and it's a very good beer. Thanks a lot, and go Pokes. There you go, a little Anderson Valley summer solstice. Daniel, I'm going to put that up on the website so people can keep track and play along. It appears I can get it some pretty close to my apartment. That's why I picked it, because I can get it at Wegmans. Hell yeah. Done. I'm going to get this for Saturday. Week one. Brett, our hop-pensive coordinator. Boom. All right. Everybody out there, have a safe, have a happy Labor Day weekend. Enjoy week one of college football. We've been waiting for this for months on end. Thankfully, it is finally here. Don't forget to get on out to solidverbal.com. You can find links all over to join our weekly pick'em pool, or you can just go to solidverbal.com slash pick'em. That's P-I-C-K-E-M. Don't forget to subscribe to The Athletic by going to theathletic.com slash solidverbal and claim your 40% off offer. (sighs) Don't forget to tweet us. Don't forget to call us at 408-VERBAL-1, 408-837-2251. Dan, I think I am all out of housekeeping notes. Don't forget to enjoy yourself. Yeah, man. You too. Yeah. Follow follow Solid Verbal on Twitter. Follow Dan Rubenstein. Follow Ty Hildenbrandt. You know, it really is just going to be angry tweets about the Bowling Green game. So you yeah. don't have to. I post good pictures of food though. Ty's really the better, the better follow. He'll he'll give you podcasting and audio visual <laughs> advice. So that's the move, really. But thank you for listening. I'm excited. Thank you to everyone out there for bearing with us through the long, cold doldrums of the offseason. College football is officially back. For that guy over there, my good friend Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildebrand, thanks again for tuning in. We'll catch you all on Sunday with a week one recap. Stay solid. Peace.